welcome to the AV Forums podcast for the 7th of May and uh, joining me on this edition are assistant editor Steve Withers. That son of a bitch stole my idea. News editor Mark Hodgkinson. There's something very familiar about all this. And games editor Mark Botwright. October 21st. 2015. Right, kicking off, Steve, you were discussing the uh, the Sony event that you were at two weeks ago at uh, Pinewood. Now, some of that was about 4K in terms of uh, consumer electronic stuff, so TVs and uh, delivery systems like Netflix. But the other flip of the coin is obviously the professional side of the industry and uh, how 4K is captured and uh, the workflow that's involved in getting that, that footage from the camera to the screen and uh, all the various things that they can do with digital technology nowadays. So um, what was it that they showed you and uh, what was it that stood out for you? Well, basically, Sony's opened what they call their Digital Motion Picture Centre at Pinewood Studios. And the idea behind this is it gives opportunity for directors, for directors of photography, for cameramen to actually get some hands-on experience with Sony's cameras, specifically their F55 and F65 4K cameras. Um, and also a chance to practice doing things like uh, digital grading and, and color timing, that kind of stuff. And it basically gives an opportunity to, to go through the entire workflow from capture to um, final product in, in one area. So they have like a small studio, they've got the camera set up. And you can go in there and they basically it gives people a chance to either experiment if they're thinking of using, say, the F65 in a film. They want to see if they can get the right effect that they're looking for or just to practice using it before they actually start shooting. Um, and so we got we got basically they run it as a one day course, but we got a crash course for about two hours, uh, sort of an hour on the camera and an hour in the in the digital mastering suite. And um, I got to say it's fascinating because I mean I know that uh, we saw a digital grading suite when we were at uh, Galaxy Studios, didn't we, Phil? And um, it struck me at the time that the footage that they were grading was basically very washed out. Uh, and that's quite often the way that footage is captured now. You know, a lot of the work isn't done on the set in terms of lighting or effects. It's done afterwards in post. Yeah, it, even capturing video nowadays, uh, everything that's captured on our video camera is captured flat. Um, and then it needs to be graded. So you need yeah. to add your gamma curve back in and then you need to add your colours and stuff back in. And a lot of the stuff that uh, we, we've seen at Galaxy Studios and what you've seen at Pinewood and what we've seen in the past, um, it's... It's amazing how quickly that that kind of software that uh, actually comes down the chain in terms of price and availability and you know being able to use that kind of technology. It's uh, it's actually amazing how how much power um, you need a good PC, but spend a few grand on a good PC. It's amazing how much power you have nowadays in terms of image grading and editing and all sorts. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's, it's really democratized the whole thing. It, well, I mean, it's um. This suite they had set up at Pinewood, I mean, it's a professional suite, but it wasn't that expensive. It was about 60 grand, which, you know, in professional terms is neither here nor there. Um, they had a VW1000 uh, projector set up, big screen, um, a couple, uh, an OLED um, grey one um, monitor, professional monitor. And the guy was basically taking the footage that we'd shot with the F65 in the studio next door. And then he took the footage and basically, you're right, he added in the gamma curve, as he called it, density. Um, you know, he was adjusting the, the colour palette. Um, he was taking away bags from underneath or black black, black circles around the eyes of the actress, making it look be better, basically pretty cosmetic touches, if you like. Um, he was saying how, you know, they, they can fix makeup mistakes. Uh, they now they can, they can do so much in post that, A, saves film production a lot of money because you haven't got to go back and reshoot it. Um, but also, um, you know, what they're doing now is they're doing a lot of the grading on the set right after the footage has been shot, so they'll shoot 20 minutes, they'll send the, the stuff over to the uh, grader, and he'll do a lot of the work there and then. So when it goes to the editor, it's already been mostly graded, and then they have to do a bit more fine-tuning later. Uh, again, saves money, and if there's any problems, they can go back and reshoot it. But, you know, it, it just shows you how different film production is now when they're not using 35 millimeter film, uh, when it's digital capture. The process, there is so much flexibility. And what I was acutely aware of was how subtle the manipulation of the colour palette was by the grader himself. So not just in DCI colour space for cinema release, but also in terms of Rec 709 for home, home, home theatre release for Blu-ray, DVD and TV. Um, and when you realise the kind of subtlety, levels of subtlety that's being used here to manipulate your emotions in terms of the, of these, of the scene, in terms of the colours that are being used um, within the frame and between scenes, you realise how important it is to get your... Uh, TV or projector calibrated because you know you really want to appreciate all the effort and hard work that's gone into making that scene look the way it does. 
Uh, and you won't get that if your colors oversaturated, for example. You won't get the kind of subtle, uh, deliberate and, and subtle intentions that were being put in by the grade or by the director or by the director of photography, whoever it might be, um, at the time the film was being um, graded for a Rec 709 home theatre release. So that was, that was quite uh, interesting. In terms of the actual camera, um, we were playing around with the F65, which is, you know, is a really impressive 4K. Well, actually, it's got an 8K sensor on it. Professional cinema camera. Um, with you know proper um, cinema lenses, um, we had uh, an actress, and we were practicing you know just moving the camera around while pulling focus at the same time, which is a lot more harder than it sounds. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was just it was just an incredible experience to get. I mean, you know, I actually got to shoot some footage on an F sixty five, which I can't say many people probably can say that. So that was um, pretty exciting from my perspective, and then getting a chance to watch it be graded afterwards um, by by the by the guy in the grading suite. It was a really um, you know, I'm grateful to Sony for the opportunity to do that because it is something that, you know, kind of a benefit of this job, I guess. And Christ, I've, se I've seen your camera work. <laughs> well, it was there, a there's a reason camera. why you stand in front of the camera these days. But anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a fun couple of hours and an interesting insight into um, modern digital capture, at least. Yeah, it is amazing uh, just how quickly things are moving on. And this month sees the release of Panasonic's GH4, which is a mirrorless uh, DSLR ca camera but it shoots 4K video. And it shoots that and stores it internally, and it's the first consumer camcorder uh, camera type device that does that. And I'll have it in my hands very soon to play about with it and see how good it actually is and how easy it is to edit and so on. Because there seems to be this big myth, Steve, that um, working in 4K means loads of loads of changes but actually there's there's not a lot of changes no the uh the guy doing the digital grading at the sony center at pinewood said exactly the same thing he said you know people think that the 4k workflow is harder it's not he said it's exactly the same the only difference is bigger file sizes yeah you know the, the actual file sizes are gigantic um and they also he was saying you know on a major film production they'll do at least six backups of all that cut data so the amount of data they have to store and and process is huge but aside from that, the actual process is, is exactly the same. There's no difference at all. Yeah, cool. Uh, so we'll have that and we'll, we'll obviously uh, we'll chat about that a little bit further on this month, probably in the next month, uh, and see how that works. Because if it works, then we'll, we might even start shooting our videos in 4K for uh, for AV Forum. So that was the Sony <laughs> thing. Quite interesting. We're going to start shooting me in 4K, Phil. We're going to need to get some makeup. Yeah, I was, well, I was going to say that. We're going to have <laughs> Surgery, to get... Surgery, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Quite a bit of concealer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, or Vaseline on the lens, you know. That's, yeah. that's well, at least right. a little bit, a little, a little bit of um, foundation on my forehead, on my head, so it doesn't reflect too much light. Rouge. Deliberately out of focus. <laughs> rouge, rouge, <laughs> Mark. Yeah. Like an Aunt Sally. That's why you look like on BBC Worldwide when you're on there. Didn't you? Oh yeah, they put on a lot of slap on them when I went. Pantomime Dane. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the worst thing is you forget about it when you walk out later on yeah, as well. I, I so, totally so you walk around, walk around the rest around. of the day with the makeup on. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had that happen to me, and it was only when I was sitting in the plane I realised, oh hell, I still got all this makeup on. People must have yeah. thought I was a right weirdo. Yeah, it was an accident, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, well, we're talking about Pinewood now. At the time of recording this podcast, we are recording this uh, a little bit in advance because, um, well, I'm away uh, the week that this goes out. So as you're listening to this, I'm not in the country. Two things have happened in the last uh, sort of 24 hours the time we're recording this, which we think we need to talk about anyway. Um, so the first one is bad news yet again. Another uh, very good actor has passed away today, that Bob Hoskins. Um, at the time we're recording this, 71-year-old. Uh, um, yeah, he, he, a, a great actor, somebody who I enjoyed watching on screen, even if it was not the greatest movie in the world. He, he, he had a certain gravitas, he had a certain personality that, that always came across well. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a real, it's a real shame. Um, I've been a fan of Bob Hoskins since I saw The Long Good Friday, um, and you know he's an unlikely film star. He's a short, fat, balding Cockney, but um, but he had a great screen presence, and um, he was a great actor. He had actually retired uh, in 2012 because he developed Parkinson's rather sadly, um, but uh, his death at 71, which is these days really quite young. Um, of pneumonia, it was a real shock. I, I didn't expect that at all. It was very sad, very sad indeed. Honestly, I think the atmosphere generally gets a little bit killed when we start off every podcast with who's dead. <laughs> you know, this week on the In Memory of podcast. That's oh, not our fault that they're dropping down dead, is it? I know, but we managed to eke out about 10 minutes on Paul Walker, for Christ's sake. 
That was, that was a great a loss. That was His a family loss. wouldn't manage to fill that time. <laughs> Yeah, well, clearly you're not a fan of the, the Fast and the Furious franchise, but if you were, you'd appreciate how what terrible news that was. You know, I mean, they put into jeopardy the seventh film in the series, which could well be the greatest film of all time. So, on that basis alone, it was a shock. Um, and he was really young, and he died in a slightly you know ironic way. So that made yeah. it funny. <clears throat> I mean, in all seriousness, it is a shame. Oh no, Long Good Friday was a classic. Uh, Mona Lisa, he was great in Mona Lisa as well. That's yeah, what and I was the BT to think adverts. Of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was, a, he was a great character actor who somehow managed to become a leading man, which is kind of unusual in itself. But um, but yeah, I mean, I miss old Bob. It's a real shame. So moving on swiftly, as we're probably upsetting Mark a bit more now, uh, we're going to set, upset him even further by talking about Star Wars. Uh, episode 7, the cast has been announced, Steve. And um, I've got to say, I'm quite excited because uh, and apart from the usual suspects that we knew were going to be in this, a lot of unknowns in there, which seems to be... Um, the right way to do it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I do believe this may not be all of the cast. I think there might be some more announcements later. And given that uh, we're fast approaching May the 4th and there's a tendency for big Star Wars announcements on May the 4th because of the whole May the 4th be with you kind of gag, I think we'll see more. But yeah, it was it was interesting because um, first of all, they, I mean, everyone kind of knew it, but they actually confirmed that you're getting back Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, um, Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker and um, Peter Mayhew. So that's everybody apart from Billy D. Williams, who hopefully will also be in it at some point. Um, but you're right. Apart from that, there's been a really interesting and very eclectic mix of actors, some of whom I am familiar with, but a lot of whom I'm not Um yeah, you've got things like Max von Sydow, which is a really interesting choice. And the idea of Max von Sydow in a, in a Star Wars movie is, is pretty cool. Um, you've got Andy Serkis in there, uh, suggesting, I guess, that there might be some motion capture going on. Um, hopefully not John Jar Binks. Oh, that's all right. Him. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I thought I was on mute then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's Donald Gleeson, son of Brendan Gleeson, who most recently was in About Time and was also in Dread. Um Oscar Isaac, who, who was just recently in um, Inside Lewin Davis, the new um, Coen Brothers movie, and was very good in that. And Adam Driver, who actually was also in Inside Lewin Davis, and has also been in the HBO series Girls, which I haven't really seen. There's John uh, Boyega, who was in Attack the Block, so he's a young English actor. Uh, and Daisy Ridley, who is a young English actress who I've never heard of, and apparently has only been in like, a couple of things, including Casualty, uh, which I believe everyone in, in the UK acting for Nerdity has been in at some point. Um, but it's good, yeah, you're right, Phil, that they're picking some unknowns or relative unknowns and character actors rather than star names in much the same way as when Lucas cast Star Wars back in 76. You know, he cast unknowns plus Peter Cushing and, and um, Alec Guinness, uh, which, you know, is an interesting mix of character actors uh, and uh, unknowns. So yeah. I wasn't particularly excited about Star Wars Episode Seven, but I'm getting a little bit excited now. Yeah, I'm trying not to after the whole getting burnt up. Back in 99, it's... Don't do it to yourself. Yeah. I know. <laughs> the other interesting thing is that that one photograph that has been released looks like it's been sh- uh, taken on what looks like a set of some type. Uh, but nice to get back to physical type sets rather than just green well, screens as well. Like, and... Actually, that's what I was... Um, that open space they're sitting in, I saw that when I was peeking into uh, the, the 007 stage at Pinewood last week. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just mostly boxes and stuff and green screen. There wasn't much in there, but they did have pieces of polystyrene set outside that looked a bit spaceshipy. Um, and as I said earlier, at the back on, on some open ground, they kind of were building buildings that looked very Tatooine esque. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, JJ uh, JJ has already gone on record as saying he wants to shoot as much as possible on real sets, real locations, which is good. And he we, shoots on 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 thirty five mm to film. I was just going to say we've just been we've just been discussing the whole digital filmmaking side of things. Um, interesting, you know, Lucas did the uh, majority of the prequel stuff on digital. He pi- pioneered a lot of that. Um, well, it's a Sony camera as well, Phil, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, in two thousand, it was a Sony camera used on clones. Yeah, but it's it's quite funny that JJ's gone completely one hundred and eighty degrees and back to thirty five mil. Um, it's interesting. Seems to be a bit of a trend because uh, the Amazing Spider-Man Two was also shot on on super on thirty five mil, despite being a, a Sony production. And the previous one was shot on their cameras in three D, and this one was shot in two D on, on on film. So there seems to be a bit of a trend at the moment for directors and directors of photography to um, go back to shooting on uh, on thirty five mil, which is interesting. We'll come back to that again when I talk about this week's film because that was also shot on film. Okay, I'll look forward to that, Steve. But, but first of all, I'd really like to know what Mark Botwright thinks. Uh, about what? 
the the film or <laughs> what, what we've just been talking about. Mark, what we've been talking about for ten well, sweet, yeah. minutes, Mark. <laughs> obviously, obviously, at the time of recording this, uh, Chelsea are playing in the Champions League, which is probably why Mark's a little bit distracted at the moment. Honestly, I don't have Sky, so I'm I'm not watching it. I would have been streaming it, uh, but no, actually, it's the snooker <laughs> I'm watching. Snooker. <laughs> <laughs> Distracted by the snooper. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Neil Robinson's pulled it back to nine eight against Judd Trump. Um, but yeah, the the cast. Um, I think there's there's initially I thought great, you know, kind of unknowns, but then kind of two words, Hayden Christensen, kind of sprang to mind, and I just thought there's there's always going to be that risk that should we say unknown will will equate to I don't know almost not necessarily poor but almost smothered by the project as it is you know it'll almost be too much you know there, there's a reason why you go for uh, i mean just talking about bob hoskins a, a kind of figure who can carry a, a film who can you know kind of be the the center point of it all um but it also comes in a week when uh we've had news about if i can just broach the topic of games a bit early but um word that the star wars expanded universe is going to now be considered non-canon and so, therefore, going forward, all films, all books, anything like that will have to be part of, you know, interlinking, interconnecting stories. Um, so I think it, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm perhaps a little bit more enthusiastic than you, Phil, but I do worry that it's going to be a kind of ensemble piece of some some description. It's going to be almost going so far the other way towards fan service and to try and branch out to create as many characters as possible to be able to to you know give disney so many offshoot possibilities as well, to kind of muddy the waters well let's face it they didn't pay billions of dollars mm. just to sit on the franchise they are going to milk it for everything that they can which is my concern my main concern is they're going to milk it for everything they can um, Depends, Phil, doesn't it? I mean, if they milk it but what they produce is quality <laughs> cream then all well and good i mean if you look what they're doing with the marvel franchise that i think they've done a pretty good job with that so i'm not over, overly concerned about because i mean let's be honest i mean lucas has milked this pretty badly already i mean if I, you know, like i think we said this before but if, we, if i see yoda on tv one more time advertising pc world i'm going to kick my tv screen in so i think milking that's already been milked um if they can do it in a way that's creative and interesting then great and i never really considered any of the expanded universe stuff to be canon anyway basically it was the films and clone wars i think were the only things that were ever really considered canon after that it was all cobblers um, and that includes the games, Mark. No, oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I will go out on, on a limb here oh, and say... Oh, Shadows that, of the Empire. Was that ever considered? Was that ever uh, considered? I don't know. But look, Knights of the Old Republic was the greatest Star Wars story that, that wasn't made by, by Lucas. That was absolutely fantastic. And my worry is, is that if they're going to go down the route of saying everything from here is has to be canon, it, it restricts what they can do. And and part of the reason why you do get things like like, you know, Knights of the Old Republic or or even like like Clone Wars is that they're allowed to take those risks. If you're going to funnel everything towards, you know, the same stories or, or looking at the same the same characters and trying to expand simply upon their backstories and and their worlds, you're restricting yourself so much. It just it, it just seems a strange thing to do. They, well, they, they must be really confident. What they, they said be... was that everything going forward will be canon, but everything in the past yep. isn't. But so that tradition- doesn't mean that they're restricting themselves. No, well, it does. It it, it means what? such. But well, what risks can you take if everything has to be canon? If everything has to interconnect? There have been so many games down the years which have kind of died a death because the rights they got to or from a film or from a comic book or from whatever they were held to say you have to put in this, this, and this, and it must marry up with this universe. You can't take as many risks with that. You know, it, it just seems a strange thing to do if they were planning on milking this as much as possible. You would think they, you know, want to move out in so many different kind of, you know, bizarro universes that they could. They must be so confident that what they're going to make with this film and build that momentum going forward, that everything they do will work, will interconnect and will be of sufficient quality. Mm, well, I mean, I'm prepared to... You know, I'm prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt until 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 they prove me wrong. I'm glad that I'm sure they're glad to hear that, Steve. <laughs> yeah, must, that'll be on the post. I relief coming out of Disney right now. Yeah, no, that'll be on the poster, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, we won't let you down. Honest. 
<laughs> I mean, given what we've, what we've put up with in the past, I mean, it's got to be better, right? I mean, it couldn't be worse than the Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones. Stop swimming. Don't tempt fate. <laughs> or the droids can't, a cartoon series of, you know, Ewoks. For God's sake, Ewoks. I mean, let's be honest, it all went downhill from Jedi anyway, so we're kind of polishing a turd at this point, aren't we? And on that lovely visual metaphor, should we Sorry, move on to the next Hodge, subject? <laughs> well, I haven't heard from Hodge yet. On Star I Wars, I, I couldn't yeah. really give a monkeys at this stage <laughs> no, I mean I'm, I'll be interested when it comes out and I'll and I'll guess I'll be a bit more excited when I start seeing some trailers and the like but a cast list does very little to get my juices flowing to be quite honest so yeah I, I, the last, as, as I said the last three were awful that last four weren't great so yeah I, you know, I hope it is good but uh, this news doesn't excite me in any way I was just going to say the, the problem is with you know, the idea of getting excited about the cast list is if you look at the cast list for the prequels, you know, if you said to someone, you know, they're going to be making, you know, Star Wars films and you'll have Samuel L. Jackson and, you know, kind of Jimmy Smits and various other people, you'd have said, absolutely, this is going to be the best thing ever. You know, so the cast list, it, it, it's all it all comes down to the quality of the writing, the quality of the writing and the direction. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the problem with the, I mean, you look at the prequels, I mean, they had very good actors in them. They were all bloody awful because the writing was terrible and the direction was awful and they were just standing in green rooms and had nothing to react to. And that's why, I mean, so you can't really just knock Hayden Christensen. I don't think he's a terrible actor. I've seen him in stuff where he's been very good. But, you know, what chance did he have in those films any more than, you know, Ewan McGregor or Natalie Portman? They were equally as poor. I've got faith, I've got more faith in J.J. Abrams' abilities to deliver an entertaining movie than I do in Lucas, who hadn't directed a film in yeah, you said 20 in, years. In, I think that... <clears throat> The important thing there is that you said entertaining. Yeah. Because it's <laughs> that that's Abrams. It's it, so I think there's going to be a lot of fans who are probably not going to like the movie, even though it hasn't been shot yet. You just know that that's going to be the case. Let's you just, you just have to look at the two Star Treks that he's made. Um, yeah. And uh, really enjoyable movies, technically brilliant, but you know the real Trek fans didn't like them. Well, as long as the films don't open with a crawl talking about taxation of outlying star systems, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, let's move on. Um, and uh, let's go to AV questions because uh, we've had quite a few questions come in via Twitter and uh, email. And don't forget, you can email us. It's podcast at avforums.com. Uh, right, so we did a thing, two podcasts back, Steve, about aspect ratios. And yeah. I believe you've had an email from Damien asking another question, which you're going to answer. That's right, Damien Stanworth, who asked, uh, in the podcast last week, you discussed aspect ratios and the correct settings. What I've never fully understood, though, is how the various aspect ratios affect the resolution. Mainly, that when watching, say, a full HD content presented in aspect ratio wider than 16 to 9, or 69 display, um, what is, what's the effect of the black borders? Well, okay, basically, the image, the image that's being sent to the TV, the full 16 to 9 ratio, which that's full HD. But clearly, if you're watching a 2.35 to 1 movie, You've got black bars, the top and bottom. So some of the resolution is lost because of those black bars. I mean, did you work no, out no, the 800 it's not lines? Lost. It's not lost, it's there. Well, it's not lost, it's there, but it's just, just black the bars. bars. Yeah. So actual visible um, screen information, if you know what I mean. Actual screen information will be about 800 lines of it, won't it, Phil? Probably. 810, if it's a Thank 239 to 1, 810. Um but you're not losing anything. I mean, that's just the way the film is. Is it was composed and shot, and that's yeah. Why you're meant I, to I think see. this is where people get confused. They think they're losing resolution because there's black bars there. No, it's still a 1920 by 1080 uh, image. It's just that the visible image, once you take into account the black bars, it's 810. There's still 1080 lines there. It's just, some, yes. it's just a lot of them are black with nothing in them. Uh, which, if you then go to projection, which myself and you do steve where we zoom up um then you can cause problems if you zoom to, on a too large a screen then um because you are then losing resolution uh, because you're getting rid of the black bars off the screen and you're also zooming it up so you're going to more affect the scene the uh, the pixels um so you've got to be careful that's the only time you really need to be careful though yeah, but the, in terms of um, what the display is receiving, it's a full 1080p image, regardless of the aspect ratio of the original film. Yeah. Hope that answers your question, Damien. Yeah, I hope that answers it, Damien. And, uh, you know, don't get any demons onto us if uh, if you weren't happy with the answer. Yeah. <laughs> don't my head cut off by a piece of <laughs> sheet of glass. 
<laughs> uh, but don't forget, if you have got any questions or you want to ask us about uh, anything that, that we review or any of the techniques that we use or whatever, um, maybe a little bit on calibration or so on, uh, then do send us an email at podcast.avforums.com or leave it in the podcast forum on AV Forums under the podcast and we will get round to uh, discussing them on future podcasts. Right, so let, let's quickly move on. Um, we did a thing on OLED, Mark. This has been kind of building up since the beginning of the year because uh, a lot of the roadmaps for this year and, and this year has been 2014, um, not what we expected in terms of OLED. We thought uh, a lot more manufacturers would be getting involved and releasing uh, certainly high-end models in their lineups. But the only manufacturers that are really doing it this year are Samsung and to a greater extent LG. LG seem to really be going with OLED. Everybody else very quiet on the technology. Uh, no announcements so far this year. Um, so we're kind of, and this is where your piece was was asking the question, you know, it, it, is OLED been the next big thing for too long? Yeah, yeah. We were, uh, it's a kind of a, a, a snapshot post-CES really, as you say, there was a, it was a disappointing uh, on the OLED front uh, in terms of announcement other than LG. And even Samsung came out just after, um, just after the events. Uh, and said that they're really finding it a lot more difficult than they thought it was going to be. So an, another three to four years before it was a commercial reality. Um, as you said, Panasonic, there was a no-show. We were expecting after IFA, um, that uh, in Berlin in September, that we would see something from them uh, in Vegas, but we didn't, bar some commercial panels. Um, so we were, we were kind of left with this thought. I mean, and joint, sorry, quite a salient point during um, sort of quick bit of research for the article. I came across your review of the 15-inch um, LG you did back, which is nearly four years ago. Yeah, I remember it. And well. I read your intro, and it was almost the identical intro to the article I'd put together. I didn't copy and paste it on this occasion. Uh, it was basically saying that it's difficult to it's difficult to uh, produce. Yields are low. Uh, life expectancy is not necessarily great, uh, and but it's you know it's coming. But this is four years on from there, and we're exactly almost exactly the same boat, bar in LG. Um, they're effectively now in charge of the large panel OLED market. It looks as though their um, the process they've gone for, which was they used to call WOLED, but now we've seemed to have rechristened to WRGB, which is just using the white OLEDs with filters, um, seems to be the one that's that's at least you know close to being able to be sold at prices that people will pay. Yeah. Um, you see, the, the one thing that pops in my mind, um, and you know, I'm going to ask this question, and let's see where we go with the answers, because um, if people out there, and when I say people, I mean like the general public, um, were interested in the best picture quality, the best black levels, the best colour saturation, mm -hmm. the best image to watch, you would say buy a plasma TV. Yeah, um, well, well, I would have but, done last year. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, 7% of the market was plasma. Yeah. The rest was LCD, LCD, LED. So that to me says there's no market for the best black levels, the best color performance, the best image. No, 4K, well, 4K has also been a massive, um, massive thing for the manufacturers. So they've seen the opportunity to knock out the LED, LCD panels uh, in a 4K resolution that, that the, with processes they're familiar with uh, and they can do fairly cheaply and therefore sell at, you know, at prices people are willing to pay in 4Ks. Obviously easier to market for them, OLED. We've been down this discussion before, but they've they've already had LED TV and now they're going to stick an O in front of it. You know, what does that mean to the general public? And as you say, yeah, Plasma lost out to LCD, LED ultimately and it was yeah, obviously so, so, so why superior is it, tech. So why is OLED going to succeed then, you know? Where is it going to succeed, or how is it going to succeed where plasma's failed? The only way I see it is is if um, price erosion in 4K is so fast that they need something else to you know to flog us next. So I mean, switch is what I don't know, five six years down the line, maybe 4K. Well, considering okay. the difficulty they're having making uh, yeah. 1080p OLED panel, God knows how hard it must be to make a 4K OLED. Panel. That is oh, that okay. Is so I think th I think the three of us have to take a step back here because obviously you know this is our day to day life and we're talking about this all the time and. Uh, getting ourselves involved, but I, I know that Mark Botwright is not as um, switched on when it comes to this. He's he's not exposed he's to what we're not exposed switched to. On at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> ah, see, uh, there you go. I knew it. Uh, so, so Mark, you're 
you know, you're not exposed to the to the same extent as as the the other three of us here are. From your point of view, and and going on the points that we've made so far, would you go out and buy buy an OLED TV? Oh, um, see, the problem is is that I'd be using it predominantly for gaming, um, and should we say games don't tend to be as as kind of um, as demanding as films. There's there's certainly less you know subtle gradation in colours and the like. You know they tend to be very much you know there's a reason why should we say they often have vivid modes on TV and call them game modes. You know, uh, it's it's very kind of a lot of games go for lurid colours and the like. Uh, I think it would depend. It would depend on something being affordable. Uh, how responsive the panel was would come into it as well. You now, know. You BC, you're you're asking questions there that a normal punter wouldn't ask as, as well. So so even though you're quite away from from the subject compared to myself and Stephen Mark. You're still asking important questions, which we would expect people to be asking, but the general public do not ask those questions and they're not interested in what you're talking about there, i.e. response times and all the rest of it. So, come back to that. Would you buy a plasma TV or an LED LCD TV? Uh, I, I, I'd stick with plasma. Right. Which 99% of the public wouldn't. Am, or am I being unfair there, Steve? No, you're not being unfair at all, Phil. Um, I, I know from experience and, and talking to people in the wider public, not people directly related to AV, but just general paranormal people, that um, you know, plasma is perceived as being um, a difficult technology. They, 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 you know, they, they, I don't know if it's, if it's perception or the retailers, but the general public seem to have this perception that LCD is a better and easier technology to have in the home than plasma. I think, can I just say, on a very basic level, I think we've... Generally, the way that technology goes, uh, something that is heavier is seen as, you know, kind of less sophisticated, usually. You know, I know some people <laughs> view, well, they almost view, when you see, when you see something like a, a plasma screen and it's thicker than, you know, someone sees a super thin, you know, screen and they think that must be better. You know, something that, that you can kind of just pick up and yeah, mount yeah, very of, easily. Of course, of course. Yeah, and, and that's everyone what has playing. memories of you know big CRT sets, and you want to get as far away from that as possible. And that was kind of the future that flat screens were were sold to many people on. It's absolutely true, Mark. And there's no question that the LCD manufacturers have really played on the cosmetics in a big way to get them to, uh, to certainly to attract, shall we say, the other half factor. So so women particularly, I think, have liked the look, uh, the the cosmetic look of an LCD panel in in the lounge. Also. They're very bright, which is very handy for most people's houses because they aren't necessarily sitting in a, in a pitch black room. You know, they're watching TV during the day. They're watching with windows, um, big windows, and that sort of stuff. And so light, the brightness helps considerably. And they don't suffer from image retention, which lots of people are afraid of and, and think of initially when they think of a plasma. And that puts people off as well. There were also a lot of scare stories in the early days of yeah, plasma, a lot right. of misinformation. You've got to replace the gas, you know, they'll run out after five years, that kind of thing. It will cost you, you know, the price of a new panel to get I've it got, fixed. I've got a salesman on video telling me that, that I need to regas my plasma. Yeah, and that's the point I'm making about retailers. For some reason, they seem to be down on plasma when they were available and were more keen to push LCD TVs. Now, I've seen people doing that when I've been in stores as well and heard, you know, overheard conversations. What quite why that was the case, I don't know. But for some reason, pl plasma outside of the enthusiast, um, which is probably everyone listening to this podcast, um, outside of the enthusiast, there, there was definitely a perception of plasma as being a difficult technology to have in the home. Do you think any of that comes from the manufacturers? Do you think they must have yes, lent on totally. the... totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the <laughs> minute... that, I was trying to be so subtle there, Mark. <laughs> basically. Yes. The, the minute that one of these companies, Japanese companies, left the plasma market is suddenly when all these rumours and stuff started. So we'll leave it up to you to decide which one that was. So, uh, so right. Mark, what was the conclusion in, in your article about OLED? When do you think we're actually going to see... Ever are we ever going to see ever, as a mass it, market? I don't product, think. Or is it going to be like five if it's years? going to be, if it's going to happen, I reckon, I reckon for, uh, four or five years from now. Not really. In the, I mean, the, BC, I it, said it all that. I, I guess they're all going to watch and see how LG does with it. I said but, that four or five years ago, Mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're going back, back to that point. <laughs> we're going back to that point. It may just end up as a very niche. I, I think one thing that hasn't helped is is the global recession because I wrote that review just as that was that was happening. 
Um, and everybody was talking about OLED back then. And we were back to 2008, 2009. Everybody was talking about OLED. It was going to be the next big thing. Then we had the big global recession. We had the Japanese companies losing money hand over fist. They had um, even the Korean companies struggling in terms of uh, you know costs and all the rest of it. You had uh, manufacturers shutting down their panel production, buying in panels and all the rest of it. That has to have an impact on R&D and it has to have an impact on on how quickly they could get OLED to market. And there's there's that side of it. And then there's the other side, which was that we went to Monaco in 2012 for a launch of an OLED screen, which only came to market at the beginning of 2014. Yeah. I mean, I think they proved to be much more difficult to make than they could possibly have imagined when they, you know, on larger screen sizes. That's definitely been, I mean, that's been confirmed, is not it, behind the scenes. They are really difficult to make in any kind of viable production yields. But I also think, that the big issue has not been that so much. I think the big issue has been how incredibly quickly um, 4K TVs have proliferated in the marketplace and how quickly those prices have dropped, making them a very viable alternative for people looking for a new TV. And you can pick up a 4K, 65-inch 4K TV this year for three grand, three and a half yeah. grand. I mean, that that's just insane. You know, that, that you know you would have been paying twice as much as that a few years ago for even an eight high high def TV. So yeah. I mean, that that I think has thrown a bit of a, a spanner in the works as far as OLED is concerned because the manufacturing. Hang on a minute, we can make good money flogging things that are much easier to make. Yeah, so, I think that's probably the biggest. That's the definitely biggest what Samsung have thought, isn't it? I mean, Samsung yeah. obviously thought, why are we spending all this money making trying to push something that people aren't necessarily interested in right now? Yeah, for the reasons that Phil's already mentioned. Yeah, when we know we can sell big numbers easily, 4K, big numbers, dead easy, Ultra HD. No one, everyone's going to get get you know, understand what that means. I think explaining what an OLED is compared to an LED LCD TV, it's going to be an interesting conversation for this for the for the retailers and and manufacturers over the next few years. Yeah. Well, this has got, you know, years left to run in it. So, uh, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. We'll wrap up hardware news and uh, and and leave it at that because I've no doubt we're going to come back to this on a regular basis. Uh, certainly, as we get into quarter four and into the new year, it's going to be interesting to see a what the sales figures have been like for LG and whether anybody else come, you know, IFA and then CES towards the end of the year and then into early next year, uh, whether OLED comes to market or not, or whether we're still looking at LED, LCD, 4K panels and uh, and no Blu-ray. I'm not going to go into it, Steve. I don't want you to get... <laughs> yeah. you, you hear a podcast. gunshot in the background. Yeah, 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 we, little... yeah we, we want to cheer things up a little bit. So uh, anyway, that wraps up hardware. Uh, talking about cheering up, we're going to go and speak to Mark next for Games News. Right, Mark, uh, Xbox One launching in China, that's a huge market for them. Yes, it is. Um, coming from the, the news that they were going to be launching in Japan, they finally set a release date for that. Um, they're now looking at China for September, um, which is it's it's kind of interesting simply because they will be the first one of you know the big console manufacturers to hit the Chinese market because there's been a, a, a barring of sale of foreign-made consoles for some time in China, um, so you can get which led to some kind of funny knockoffs and the like. Uh, but you kind couldn't of, buy like an Xbox 360 or a PS3 in China? Not officially. There were obviously ways and means to get them. Um, why why but were you, they banned? Uh, well, they were foreign. They're, and it, in fact, this, this news comes with a great quote from a chap from the Ministry of Culture in China. Um, goes through the usual things that are hostile to China or not in conformity with the outlook of China's government won't be allowed. Uh, and then he, he finishes with that. Just I just think is brilliant. We want to open the window a crack to get some fresh air in, but we still need a screen to block the flies and mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> that just about sums up China, <laughs> which is brilliant. And uh, I, I, you know, it's they're the fact they're allowing this um it's it's kind of in conjunction with the chinese company so it's i think perhaps microsoft have learned a few things from their time um failing to hit the japanese market certainly with the original uh xbox uh but it's it's a huge market i mean the sheer volume of people but you would think should we say that there's a disparity between the rich and the poor obviously in china but the the size of the market what it is 14 billion dollars worth um the the only thing is the majority of those because there's been this kind of block of you know foreign consoles and china haven't been exactly quick to make their own consoles 
the majority of that market is PC and mobile, so a lot of kind of browser games. But Microsoft are kind of hoping that with this, should we say, a bit of a crossover with the PC market, with obviously them being well positioned there, they might be able to make inroads. But yeah, it, I mean, it's got got the potential to be to be big, but I don't think anyone's exactly, you know, banking on them being able to crack that market. Okay, um, and moving on quickly because we. Again, we've, we've spoken about too much AV again this week. And, uh, we're do too on message, aren't we? These uh, I do apologise for that in advance, people. Um, Nintendo not having a press conference at E3 this year, Mark, but um, they haven't got anything to talk about, have they? Oh, um, th- that's harsh. Harsh but fair, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they, they didn't last year, and it's, it's again, it, it's this kind of idea that perhaps they can eschew the big kind of grandstanding press conference and that, you know, they've said they want to approach things a reinvented approach to to you know getting their message across and so they're going to have video presentations and videos of gameplay demos and the like and there's going to be a super smash brothers tournament but it does seem very much like it's it's projecting that image of of a company that's starting to falter in the home console market and is just kind of trying to recede a little bit from what is i mean it costs a huge amount to put on these these press conferences and, and the like but it's I mean, it's almost like a counterpoint to why Microsoft failed in Japan. I was reading a fascinating article about that, about how you know Microsoft didn't understand the Japanese corporate culture and and how she would say you needed to to socialise with the people in the same sector for a long time before you built trust and familiarity. And that's almost what kind of E three is seen as to many people. It, it's a you know, it's as much showing the public about things as it is about kind of networking and getting your face out there. And the fact that Nintendo are kind of pulling back from that and just sticking out these these videos, that's I mean, they're really just kind of fan service. If you don't know they're out there already, mm. you're not going to know about it during the month of E three. You see this is uh this is something that we discussed very quickly uh, not too long ago, Steve, about uh, CES and big shows like that. And the fact that um, a lot of these big companies like Microsoft, who have pulled out CES, um, they pulled out two years ago now. Um, yeah. And you have other companies like Sony talking about possibly pulling out of the, these types of shows and holding their own press events because they get the journalists to themselves for you know, two or three days just to talk about a Sony product or a Microsoft product. Um, so it's interesting to see that Nintendo are, are possibly even taking that one step further and just having the press conference online and not even attending the E3 show. It just seems, it seems absurd on the one hand, but on the other hand, well, maybe, they're, maybe they're doing the right thing and, and maybe that's the trend that's happening now. You just have to look at how Apple, you know, manage their ro- release schedule and releasing products and how they do it on a day that they pick and and they get all the press of themselves on that day. Um, it seems to be the way that the industry is moving. Yeah, I can see the logic behind it. Uh, I think Samsung have also talked about doing something similar um, because you know, as you say, Phil, you get the, you get all the press to yourselves. Obviously, there is the higher cost attached to doing something like that, and therefore it's slightly more risky if your products don't generate the right kind of you know if you've got a dodgy product out there, you can hide it in amongst all the others, but if it's just you. Then clearly um, you might get negative press out of it, so that's always a, a risk, you know, downside to that sort of um, approach. But yeah, I can see why. I mean, the only thing is, though, from our perspective, if everyone starts doing that, you know, whereas at the moment we can go to CES or so we can go to EFA and cover a lot of things in a couple of days, if, if all of them start doing their own thing, you know, we'll be going to stuff from here to doomsday. Won't yeah, we? well, you're never you're never going to be at your desk, are you? You're going to be going to different no. things here, left, right, and centre. Um, but it is interesting as well from from that angle and certainly the angle that Nintendo taken. I mean, Mark, yeah, uh, Hodge, you never go to CES yet. You know more about what's going on at CES than me and Steve, who's actually standing in the main hall. Yeah, exactly. I get all the I get to see all the press releases and a bit more of an overview of the coverage. Uh, and I can imagine it just must be bedlam when you're there. So it's difficult to take in a press conference when you're actually sat there watching it without sort of printed materials or videos. Of, you know, no, Mark, sometimes, sometimes you just can't even get in the press conference. I've never yeah. been to a Samsung press conference, <laughs> not once. <laughs> yeah, uh, Aoife, Aoife or CES. Well, Aoife, they split themselves out, didn't they, Samsung? Didn't they have their own um, event, event slightly They had a big from... event the, day, the night before, yeah. yeah. They did do, they did do, they was sort of at Aoife, but separate in a way, if, if you see what I mean. But I guess it make, from their perspective, it means that they could keep the cost down, they could do a big event, but they knew everyone was already going to be there, rather than having to Captain, fly. Yeah, there is always a risk that 
I company will invite a load of journalists and they'll not turn up. <laughs> I guess it's that is the other possibility. Not, yeah. not everyone's not everyone's Apple or you know or Samsung or or Microsoft. So I guess maybe Nintendo didn't risk you know, inviting a load of journalists out for them not to turn up. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see that at E3, and of course you're going to be keeping us up to date with everything that's happening from uh, from that conference, aren't you, Mark? Yes. Me. Or him. <laughs> Either, either, you. <laughs> we both are. I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll sort it out. Uh, anyway, that's Games News. We'll be back in a sec with movies. Okay, for some reason we are really uh, over time, so we're going to have to crack on very quickly. Uh, so let's cue up the music, and it's uh, Mark's AV Snack. Here we go. Uh, buy um, six big fat sausages, your favourite sort. Uh, I'm quite keen on Cumberland, so six big fat Cumberland sausages, which would be about 350, 400 grams worth of sausage meat. Um, buy some puff pastry. Do not try and make it. Uh, you can get very good stuff, uh, frozen or fresh. Um, make sure it's all butter. Um, obviously, you'd need to defrost it before starting if you bought the frozen stuff. But um, some fresh herbs. Uh, a chopped up apple if you fancy, salt and pepper, and, and that's about it really. So you would roll out uh, 500 grams of uh, of your pastry into a rectangle, which would be uh, the thickness of around about three quarters of a centimetre, maybe a bit less, half centimetre. Um, you will split your sausages open using a knife and take out the meat, mix it in a bowl with your other ingredients, which would be your apple. Maybe um, some fresh herbs would be nice, some sage or something. Um, salt and pepper in the apple, mix it all around with your hands and then um, form it into, well, you know, a roll and then put it all across um, your pastry. So you would have, it would take up, I don't know, probably that amount would be about a metre, that'd be about a metre long or something also. Um, lay your sausage meat across the middle, fold either side of the um, the pastry in on itself so it meets in the middle. Brush with beaten up egg and milk. Stick it in an oven at gas mark 7, which is what, uh, 220, 420 electric. Uh, 15, 20 minutes, come out golden brown. Chop them up into small slices and there uh, you've got sausage rolls. That won't be pink. Well, well, why would the pastry be triangular? Did I say that? Yeah. Rectang- did I not say rectangular? He said rectangular, not triangular. Ah, I just said what I thought. That's a bonus. Yeah, rectangular. Uh, simple, probably preparation time, 10 minutes, and they t- they'll taste delicious, much nicer than the stuff you get at Greg's. Thing is, I've got two traditional bakers in the village who both make really nice homemade sausage rolls. Well, I wouldn't bother in your case then. <laughs> <laughs> There's something quite rewarding about, about, about working with pastry, and it is also very simple. Right. Which is kind of a message. Okay. Um, it's obviously going to be a new experience. I don't think I've ever sat down with a, a sausage roll to watch a, a movie. Have you, Steve? Uh, probably at some point. I think I'm a big fan of sausage rolls. I do like a sausage roll. I must admit, and the, and the idea of freshly baking my own sounds like a, is a good one. Mark, I'd be up for that. And it smells so, um, very, it smells very nice. Yeah, the, the thought of having freshly cooked sausage rolls wafting around the kitchen in the house that actually sounds quite appealing. In fact, I'm salivating as I say it. So yeah, yeah but you just definitely. like things wafting around your house. Oh, uh, you know what? I, I'm trying to work out why it doesn't seem like an AV snack to me. Uh, what, is a, what is an AV snack? No, That's the question it, I ask myself on a weekly basis. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, it's because if you eat it as you would normally eat it, where you'd pick it up and use your fingers, then you're going to have greasy fingers for touching the remote control. Good point. That's why oh. AV snacks tend to be things like popcorn, anything that's crunchy. voice control now, Mark. Everything's voice control. You I, can do it all yeah. with your voice. Yeah, but you're yeah. still sitting there but with you, greasy but fingers. But you've got a mouthful, so therefore you can't. You just spray no, the screen. You could use a yeah. fork. But oh, that's a bit poncy. <laughs> No. Oh, right. People. Eat it at the start of the movie. A, a What's the minimum cake... run time? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's depending on the length of the movie. Yeah, so, so I'm now, sitting like down beforehand. Up. I'm eating the sausage roll and then I'm going to watch a film. What part of that is my AV snack? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say use a, use a small cake fork, take it in with you, and eat your sausage roll that way. That'd be I have no idea what a cake fork looks like. <laughs> 
It smells like a fork, but it's smaller. It's like a fork with an edge that's, you know, you know got a heart. it's got a thicker edge, isn't it, Mark? We use thicker edge, yeah, to... getting through pastry. Yeah, yeah, it's you sell, buy yourself a fork as well, treat yourself. So middle class. <laughs> I don't see the problem with eating with the hands. I mean, I'm not suggesting you sat there, you know. There's nothing worse, there's nothing worse yeah, than what? eating with your hands and then greasy. Th- oh, no, it's Having not. seen some some of the fingerprints and grease stains on some of the stuff you photograph, Mark, I can see what you don't. But <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of us, <laughs> civilised. Well, world. the best bit was he sent me clips through for a video review today, and one of them was called "Corner of Player with Dust." <laughs> <laughs> didn't know it's tell you what, actually, a close-up shot is really very hard to get the dust off or keep it it's off awesome, because it just comes it? back again as soon as you uh, dust it. It's the bane of my life. Like, They're dust. like giant magnets, aren't they? Giant dust magnets. And you can't see it with your eyes sometimes. It's only with the camera no. settings. You see, yeah, but the thing it. is, you, oh, must, yeah, you must have checked, you must no, have checked it, the encoded it, and then named it. <laughs> what about the other one? The other, the other, the other week, uh, something like um, footage straight with cat. Did you, did you, <laughs> did you appreciate that? <laughs> The cat and the reflection. Yeah, there, but the yeah, thing is, it? your footage is never straight. And if anybody wants proof of this, just go to the front page and look at the uh, Roku uh, review and that's, look that's, how look how squint quirky. that is. <laughs> you photographed that on your on your on the armrest of your sofa, didn't you? It's a jaunty angle. It's a jaunty angle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was to reflect, reflect a jaunty product. The thing is, that camera has got a, got a thing that tells you when you're straight, <laughs> yeah. which never works when Steve's got the camera in his hand. All yeah, right, so we're Mark's gone, so we need to move on swiftly. Uh, what's at the cinema, Steve? This week, Phil, it's Transcendence, which is the directorial debut of the amusingly monikered Wally Pfister, who is previously best known as the DP for Christopher Nolan. film stars Johnny Depp and Paul Bettany, along with a bunch of actors that Pfister's obviously worked with before uh, with Nolan on his movies, including Rebecca Hall, Morgan Freeman and Killian Murphy. Um, Transcendence is, is basically a kind of return to the, the big idea sci-fi films that were very popular in the 70s specifically and it's very similar to in some respects films like Colossus the Forbin Project and most um, definitely Demon Seed I don't know if anyone remembers Demon Seed from the late 70s um, with Julie Christie um, Transcendence is based upon um, these theories that have been put forward by a number of scientists and researchers specifically Ray Kurzweil who invented the first um, synthesizer and he puts forward this idea um, of what he, call, what he calls a singularity which is the point at which human and machine become one so the idea is that uh, artificial intelligence gets to the point of sentience it, it has self-awareness and then it evolves exponentially in terms of its ability to um, you know to think creatively um, and that's the kind of premise of the film in the film Johnny Depp's character is, is an expert in AI he gets uh, shot by some uh, terrorist group who wants to stop computers from becoming self-aware um, and in his des- desperation, his wife tr- uploads his brain, his his mind, to a computer, and he becomes like the next stage in human evolution, effectively evolving as a as um, a self aware computer. And the kind of the kind of point of the film is mu- how much of it is Johnny Depp's character still, how much of it is still him, and how much of it is just the um, you know an artificial intelligence. Um, there are action scenes in the film, although it has to be said that Wally Pfister and to that extent, to a certain extent, Christopher Nolan as well, are not very good directors of action. Unfortunately, it kind of comes across sometimes as um, the scenes in Terminator that are set in the future when Skynet becomes self-aware and takes over the world. It's like those scenes, but just not very well done and certainly not in the exciting, although a lot more highbrow, I guess. Um, where the film is strongest is in terms of its ideas. Because uh, it raises some interesting questions about human evolution and about what is, you know, how how do you prove that you're self-aware? How do you prove that you, you know, you're conscious of yourself? Um, and and that stuff's interesting. The film hasn't done very well in the US box office. It hasn't done very well critically either. And I think that's because um, perhaps people were expecting something different from Fista in terms of um, in terms of you know a bit more action and a bit, and maybe it's a bit too cerebral for its own good. But I actually quite enjoyed it because of that. I just thought it was nice to see a film which wasn't all just like, like the Amazing Spider-Man the week before. It wasn't just all crash bang wallop and loads of effects and CGI. But actually, is about something important because you know machines are evolving. Um, AI is getting better and better. At some point, a machine is become, going to become self-aware. Now, we are moving towards the point of the singularity. And if you actually want to watch a documentary called The Transcendent Man, which is about Ray Kurzweil, it's a great documentary, well worth watching, um, where he talks about his ideas. You know, I think it's a fascinating subject and one that is worth um, you know, investigating in the context of a film. Um, so in that point of view, it's, I think it's worth seeing. Uh, I think if you're interested in sci-fi, if you're interested in kind of big idea sci-fi, 
uh, and ideas around artificial intelligence and computers becoming self-aware, then, then I think it's worth going to see. As I mentioned at the earlier on, when we were talking about um, Star Wars being shot on 35mm, this was shot on 35mm as well by Fister, who obviously used to be a DP. It looks gorgeous. He actually shot it on 35mm and he colour timed it chemically, not uh, he didn't do digital grading, which and it looks gorgeous. Um, so uh, definitely worth seeing uh, if you like that kind of thing. I do, and I enjoyed it. Score? I didn't actually uh, score it. Uh, I'll, I'll give it um, seven, seven or maybe eight out of ten. It got it got an average of about six on most reviewers, but uh, but um, I'd, I'd say seven or eight. I, I thought it was okay. Uh, Kaz is actually doing the written reviews. So that should be up by the time this podcast goes up. Uh, right. So to wrap up, Steve, um, that's it. The cinema. What's coming up on Blu-ray this week? This week we got The Railway Man, which I saw at the cinema and reviewed at the beginning of the year. I thought it was a great film. Um, it's Colin Firth and Nicole Kidman. It's uh, the true story of a, a survivor from the Japanese prisoner of war camps at the Death Railway in Burma. Uh, and um, his sort of attempts to find one of the guys that, one of the Japanese guys that was actually an interpreter for the people that were torturing him and to confront him. Um, and it's a film about reconciliation, it's a film about forgiveness and, and dealing with um, the past. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lovely film, and I thoroughly recommend it. The other films available next, this coming out this week are 12 Years a Slave, which obviously won Best Film at the Oscars uh, quite recently. Uh, I've got to say, a film I found very difficult to connect with. I, I'm, you know, I know ter- slavery is a terrible thing. Do I want to sit through two hours of being shown that? Not really. Um, I didn't find it an emotion. I didn't find it anywhere near as emotionally uh, touching or as powerful as, say, The Railway Man. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not so sure I'd recommend that. And 47 Ronin, which was shot natively in 3D. I saw that over Christmas. Uh, Keanu Reeves, based upon a Japanese a tr- a true story of 47 Ronin, although this obviously this film is highly fictionalized and full of fantasy elements. Um, it's been a big bomb. I lost a ton of money last year. Um, I think something like 150 million it's lost. So it's not done very well in terms of box office but um um not a bad movie i quite enjoyed parts of it um but uh, i guess it's probably guilty of mediocrity really so of those three um i would definitely recommend the railway man okay so that's a blue rays and that's all we got time for uh, this week unfortunately the subject uh, would you rather be eaten by a crocodile or a shark uh, that'll have to wait to next week uh, so there you go um we will have to do that next week as well as uh, i'm sure some other cracking uh, subjects that we can pull out of the forums and discuss on the podcast but uh, in the meantime all i need to do now is thank mark Botwright. read my facts and Mark hodgkinson has gone. Steve Withers. Shark still looks fake. Uh, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Bookmark avforums.com for the latest reviews, news and video. Plus, why not leave us a rating on iTunes if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll be back again next Wednesday. 